In our last session of our study of the last days, you will recall that I went through Mark's version of the Olivet Discourse, and we saw all of the elements that were contained in that future prophecy that Jesus gave to his disciples about the destruction of the temple, the destruction of Jerusalem, and then all of the signs of the times that he enumerated, and then concluding with his prediction of his coming in clouds of glory, after which he indicated that that generation would not pass away until all of these things would uh, be fulfilled. And we've looked at some of the critical problems that we face with respect to the time frame that Jesus attaches to all of these things that are included in the Olivet Discourse. And we recall that the time frame that Jesus gave was in direct response to the question raised by his disciples to him when they said, when will these things take place? Now, in trying to deal with all of the material that is found in the Olivet Discourse, the first thing we have to wrestle with is our principle of biblical interpretation that we apply to the text. And one of the most important principles of biblical interpretation is that called the sensus literalis, that is, often interpreted or translated by the words, the literal sense of Scripture. Now that's somewhat misleading because in the way in which people popularly use the term literal translation, they mean by that that things take place, they come to pass in exact measure according to what was written in the Scripture. Whereas the concept of literal interpretation, as it was first set forth in the Reformation, meant that the Bible is always to be interpreted according to the sense in which it is written. Namely, that there are some forms of literary uh, structure in the Bible that are written in a sense of historical narrative, other times we encounter the form of poetry. Some language we find is, is ordinary historical language. Other language is figurative or metaphorical. Now, to keep that in mind, I want to look at the elements in the Olivet Discourse, and we'll use, again, Mark's version as a guide today. And I'm going to make a distinction between ordinary and figurative language. Now, what I mean by ordinary language is what some folks mean by literal interpretation. That is, that the, the, the text means exactly what it seems to suggest that it's saying in the ordinary use of words. Figurative language is when there's a symbolic element in the speech pattern or the literary form that is being used. Now, if we look at Mark 13 and the Olivet Discourse, we basically have three options in front of us on how to interpret the Olivet Discourse. The first option is to assume, this will be option number one, that the whole discourse is to be understood according to interpretation using ordinary language or what is normally called literal language. That's one option. A second option is the whole thing is figurative or metaphorical. And the third would be that it uses partly literal language or partly ordinary language. So some part is ordinary, and the other part would be figurative. Those are basically the options that we have as we come to that text and seek to interpret it. Now, those 
critics that we have examined so far who have used the Olivet Discourse as a lever to attack biblical trustworthiness and even the uh, accuracy of the prophecy of Jesus himself have applied ordinary literal language to the whole of the Olivet Discourse. And they see that certain parts of, of the discourse did take place according to the predictions, namely when Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple in simple ordinary language, that's exactly what happened in recorded history. And likewise, the destruction of the city of Jerusalem happened according to the ordinary language that Jesus uses in the Olivet Discourse. But if we apply ordinary language to the third critical aspect or dimension of the content of the prophecy, namely Jesus' return in glory at the end of the age, the critics say, that has not taken place literally. And they also give a literal interpretation to the statement, this generation will not pass away until all of these things are fulfilled. So you see then that if you take all of the elements of the Olivet Discourse and apply a literal translation to them, you have serious problems as the critics have raised. Now, I don't know anyone who would argue that all of the Olivet Discourse is given in figurative metaphorical language for the simple fact that the temple wasn't just figuratively destroyed in 70 A.D. and that Jerusalem wasn't simply figuratively devastated in 70 A.D., but it, both of these events transpired in literal fashion. So that leaves us really with the third option, which is looking at this text and seeing an interspersion here of ordinary language added to it with certain elements of figurative metaphorical language. And that's the approach I'm going to take to the text. Now the question then becomes, what part of the text do we deal with in terms of literal interpretation? And what part of the text do we deal with in terms of figurative interpretation? And that's when the, uh, the, the whole issue becomes complicated and somewhat difficult. Obviously, if we list the key elements of the discourse, the destruction of Jerusalem, of the temple, I think we would all agree that that language here is used in an ordinary, literal sense. And so we'll say literal or ordinary for the destruction of the temple. The second element is the element of the destruction of the entire city of Jerusalem. And we say that took place literally in 70 AD, and so we will assign literal uh, interpretation to that element. Well, what about the coming of Christ in glory? We're going to just put a question mark there right now. Did Jesus literally come back within this framework, or did he not? And we'll leave that question hanging for a second. And then we have the signs that are enumerated in there, that the disciples would be delivered up to councils, that they would be persecuted, that there would be false Christs arising, that there would be wars, rumors of war, famines, earthquakes, the appearance of the abomination of desolation, and uh, the gospel would go to all nations. Now, I'm going to separate that one out, but, but we'll say that the signs, for the most part, are understood to be taking place literally. We're talking about real earthquakes, real persecutions, real tribulation, real false messiahs, and so on. And so uh, that, for the most part, is agreed upon by biblical scholars that is to be interpreted in ordinary language or literal language.
Now, the question of the gospel to all nations is a question. And the sense and meaning of the term end of the age is a question. And, of course, one of the big questions re regard the astronomical perturbations, I'm going to call those, the upheaval of the heavens that is described as a precursor of the coming of Christ. We're going to raise a question about that, and then in the final analysis, the question of this generation will not pass away. Are we to interpret that literally or figuratively? So I'm not going to spend time dealing with those portions of the Olivet Discourse about which there's little or no debate in terms of their literalness. The temple, Jerusalem, the signs other than the ones I have extrapolated. All right. Let's, uh, let's begin, since the big question has to do with the coming of Christ at the end, let's leave that one alone for a minute. And let's look at some of these other ones that have questions attached to it. First of all, what does uh, the Olivet Discourse mean when it speaks about the gospel being proclaimed to all nations before the fulfillment of the sum and substance of the Olivet Discourse? In modern Christian expectation, there are many who believe that until the gospel is literally preached to every tongue and every tribe and every people on this earth, until the gospel penetrates every nation on the globe, Christ will not return. In fact, some of, of the world mission enterprises are fueled by the desire to fulfill this sign to hasten the day of Christ's coming. Now, my question is, twofold with respect to this particular sign. The first place, what is referred to by the nations? I don't know what the Olivet Discourse is referring to with its reference to all nations. But I can tell you this, which is an important aspect of our understanding of this text, that the phrase or the word here, nations, is used in two distinctly different ways in the New Testament. On the one hand, the word ethnoi, or nations, is used on occasion to refer to Gentile nations. But also, Israel, being composed of tribes, was also referred to from time to time in the New Testament of the nations of Israel, so that this text could simply mean that the gospel would go to all of the tribes or nations of Israel before the fulfillment. Now remember, the link to the other passage that is in dispute when Jesus said, you will not go over all of the cities of Israel until you see the kingdom of God coming in power, and so on. But now, even though I grant that as a possibility, I don't think that that's what's in view here. I do think that this is a reference to uh, different nationalities, not just Jewish tribes or Jewish nations. So if we mean by that that this literally has to be fulfilled, then obviously the critics have a strong uh, position here to say Jesus said, that this was all going to take place within a single generation, and obviously the gospel has not gone to all nations in that time frame. However, if you go to Paul's letter to the Romans, Paul in Romans talks about the gospel having been spread abroad throughout the whole world already by the time he's writing to the Romans, and he's speaking of the known world of that day, that the book of Acts and the mandate to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the, and to the, Jewish, or to the Gentile nations was already fulfilled in dramatic uh, manner by the time Paul was writing Romans, 
and he talks about the gospel having gone out to the whole world. Now that phrase is an idiomatic expression of the people to refer to the Roman world of the day, and in that case we would not interpret it literally to mean each and every single nation or tribe or tongue. So that's, that's why we have a question mark next to that phrase of the gospel to all nations. Now, the next one is also key to the whole dispute, and that is what is meant by the end of the age. And that question is so important that I'm going to spend time dealing and addressing that separately in a different lecture. Let me just say in passing that those who believe that the fulfillment of the Olivet Discourse in its entirety took place within 40 years after the pr prediction of Christ, namely within the time frame of that generation of contemporaries who heard Jesus' prophecy, believe that what Jesus is speaking about here is not the end of world history, but the end of the Jewish age, the end of the ec economy of redemption that focused upon the Jewish nation, which did come to an end coincidental with the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem, in 70 A.D. we see a decisive moment of separation of the Christian community from the Jewish community and Christianity as a world religion emerging from that crisis moment. It had been gradually moving towards that final severance that took place in 70 A.D., and we will look, as I said, in greater detail at that later on. But just in passing, uh, again, if the end of the age means the end of the world in a literal sense, then obviously that didn't take place <laughs> within the time frame of one human generation and still hasn't taken place. All right, what about the astronomical perturbations that we find where it talks uh, in the text about the, uh, the signs in the heavens in those days, beginning in verse 24 of chapter 13 of Mark, after that tribulation the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light the stars of heaven will fall, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds from the farthest part of earth to the farthest part of heaven. Now, here we're talking about what I call astronomical perturbations or visible signs, catastrophic signs, that take place in the heaven. Now, this raises a very significant question of literary style and form. For this reason, that in the Old Testament, it was not at all uncommon or unprecedented for the prophets of Israel to describe visitations of divine judgment upon the earth by using graphic imagery very similar to this imagery, indicating a catastrophic judgment brought by God upon a city or on a nation in which these uh, events were described in terms of astronomical perturbations that did not take place literally, but were prophetic forms of metaphorical language. Let me give you some examples of those uh, from my book. Uh, we read in Isaiah 13, chapter 9, or verse 9, 
verse 10 and verse 13, the following description of the judgment of God on the destruction of Babylon, or Tyre. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Now pay attention to this portion. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place. Now this language is almost identical to the language that Jesus uses in the Olivet Discourse with respect to his coming. Now there are other portions in the Old Testament where we see the same kind of language that was used by Old Testament prophecies to predict God's judgment on, and in events that have already taken place. Tyre was visited by divine wrath, Babylon has fallen, and those prophecies were already fulfilled without a literal fulfillment of these astronomical upheavals or catastrophes. Another passage is from Isaiah 34, verses 3 to 5. Here, Isaiah announces the desolation of Basra, which is the capital of Eden, and he does it in the following manner. He says, quote, The mountains shall be melted with the blood of the slain, all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll and all their hosts shall fall down as a leaf falleth from off the vine and as a falling fig from the fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea. Now, this is the language employed by the prophecy of Isaiah of events that clearly did take place without a literal astronomical upheaval. So the point is this, when we come to the Olivet Discourse, as I will look at in our next session, the question is, the big issue with the Olivet Discourse is how we understand this word here, generation. This generation shall not pass away until all of these things are fulfilled. What it comes down to in simple terms is is this to be interpreted literally or figuratively? Now we've seen the astronomical perturbations. If they're interpreted literally, then the only way we can save the Olivet Discourse is to interpret this figuratively. And to look at the coming of Christ in a different way from how we're accustomed to seeing it on this occasion. In other words, in simple terms, ladies and gentlemen, something in this text has to be interpreted figuratively, and something has to be interpreted literally, or there's no way we can salvage this text from the guns of higher criticism. And so the question that remains for us to examine is what do we look at literally and what do we look at figuratively? And most critically, again, is the time frame reference of this generation.